In Matthew chapter 6, it says, Who by worrying can add to their life? Pandemic. Do not worry about tomorrow. Pagans run after these things. National emergency. Philippians 4 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. My sheets are melting so fast. They just a An interesting fact about humanity is that whatever you feed grows. A financial pandemic. If you feed your faith, it grows. If you feed your fears, they grow. So all spiral very quickly. It's going to get worse. Some have to live and some have to die. Realize that our time is better spent talking to the Father than getting all worked up and reading and feeding our minds with the news and the media about what everybody is saying about how this is doom and gloom and how money, which we have hoped in, is lost. Hope not in money. Hope in your Father your God, Jesus Christ, your Savior. Have your faith and use it. Walk according to it. Whatever you feed grows. This is the time to press into the church, lean into the church, to be surrounded by God's people. We can offer prayers for one another. We can offer hope to one another. We can speak words of truth to one another. If you feast on the word of God and you renew your minds around the truth, your faith, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But if you go to the news and you read article after article after quote after talking head and you continue to feed those fears, they grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Whatever you feed grows. Today, did you wake up this morning and feast on the word of God and go to him in prayer? Or did you feed your fears? So welcome, everybody. Welcome to church uh, at Bethel. If you're here from for Bethel, I'm so glad that you're here joining us, even though we can't join at church. Um, if you're here joining us for the first time, hey, let us know in the notes or or somehow friend us or allow us to have a time to just to just uh, welcome you and thank you for, for coming and, and take part in the service as we show it on Facebook and on YouTube and on our website. Um, we're just glad that you're happy uh, to join us. Um, to be honest with you, I am kind of sick and tired of this. I'm speaking to an individual named Canon, and you may not know Canon, but that's just the brand of camera that I'm looking at right now as I kind of talk to you, and I'm kind of getting sick and tired of Canon. I guess uh, I guess there's nothing we could do. I guess it's kind of like Wilson uh, on uh, on Castaway. I, I've got a friend named Canon. Actually, I have two friends named Canon, uh, Canon 1 and Canon 2. It's uh, great to be with you, Canon. Actually, it's not. Uh, to be honest with you, I am sick and tired of this. Uh, I am I am implying the three I words. I am impatient, I am irritable, and I am insecure. All these things are happening. And you know what? That kind of leads to the fourth I word, which is irrational. Um, I just I just am at wit's end sometimes with the way I'm having to go about. I have driven down every road in Brandon just because I've been sick and tired of being home. Uh, I've tried to call different individuals who haven't even wanted to talk to me just because I'm kind of through with this whole process. I have seen old ladies who are sweet and kind yelling at people because they are eight feet away from them and that's just a little too close to six feet and, and I think it's just me. How about you? How are you doing in this whole process? I would imagine that you probably are in at least close to the same boat uh, that I am involved in. Sorry, I just kind of hit my uh, my stand there. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, what do we do about that? And maybe, maybe as uh, you're discussing or watching this on YouTube or on Facebook, you can comment uh, and get the conversation going. Share perhaps how you're feeling, what you're going through uh, as we continue to go through this particularly uh, unique time. Um, in the midst of that, we're talking about the remedy. And the reason we're talking about the remedy, and we're on part two of the remedy, um, the reason that we're talking about it is uh, because while the world is looking for uh, a physical cure, God is exposing the fact that there is a cure that needs to be happening in our heart. And uh, we want to talk about that. Uh, we want to talk about the things that are real happening, going on in our lives. And what does the Word of God say about that? Because that's the important thing you need to be asking yourself. Um, as a pastor, I have been uh, or have had the opportunity 
uh, to sit down and talk with many people and hear a whole lot of stories. And a lot of them have been wonderful stories of the miraculous power of God. And some of them have been some of the most heartbreaking, heart-wrenching stories that I have heard. I've sat in my office and talked to people. I've sat in coffee houses and talking to people, in malls, in prisons, in hospitals, in hospices, uh, almost anywhere that you can think to hear stories and to hear people and to pray for people. And um, I've come to find a number of things which are true. And I find that it is true of everybody. And these are some of the things that I have learned. The first thing is this, that nobody is immune to burdens and carrying burdens. No one is in a bubble. No one is made of Teflon. We are all affected by burdens that take place. The other thing is this, that when God allows um, burdens to come upon us, he doesn't hand them out evenly. I know for a fact that there are people who are carrying burdens a whole lot more difficult than what I seem to be carrying. And on top of that, he doesn't really disperse them evenly either, does he? I found that to be all the time that we kind of think, okay, well, God brings along one burden and once that other burden comes along, our, our other burden ends, another one comes along. No, that's not the way it works. Sometimes they are like bananas. They're in bunches. They're happening all the time. You know that passage of scripture? There's this passage of scripture which says that God is not going to uh, allow us to uh, be burdened by too much than we can handle or tempted beyond that we are able. There are times where I doubt that passage of scripture. There are times when I have seen people and have known for myself that I said, God, this is way past my capacity. And so all these things take place. Here's the other thing. Uh, when God allows burdens to take place, sometimes in his love, in his grace, and in his sovereignty, um, he, will, he will heal things right away. Those are wonderful times. Those are the preferred times. But sometimes God will heal over a season. Sometimes you go for a little while before you go through a process of learning and maturing, and I'm not too sure exactly everything that goes on. I can't tell you what it is, really, all of them, all the stuff. And sometimes... God will allow us to go a lifetime with certain things. He will allow us to carry a burden a lifetime. And Paul talks about this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I believe. And, and Paul is talking about a thorn in the flesh. And he asks God a number of times to take it away. And he does. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And so we're kind of stuck in this whole idea of, of burdens and carrying burdens and, and the whole process that is, is part of that. I am confident that as I'm talking to Canon <laughs> and to you guys, um, that there probably is not one person who I'm talking to at this particular time that is not going through some type of burden. If I were to come up to you and say, you know, the Lord has spoken to my heart and uh, the Holy Spirit has revealed to me that, uh, that you are carrying a burden, I don't think that that's much of a prophetic word because pretty well all the time we're carrying some form of a burden. And, um, the thing is that uh, uh, if I were to have perhaps a time when we are able to meet together at church and I were to say, hey, why don't we all, any person who has a burden, uh, come up to the front and we'll pray for you. Really, if that were the case, I think that everyone probably should be up uh, at the front uh, praying. It doesn't happen all that time for a number of reasons. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we're more private than others. Some of us are more lazy than others. Some of us are more self-cautious of of others. Uh, some of us are more distracted uh, of others. And uh, and I could I could go on and talk about why perhaps you don't come and, and deal with some of the burdens that you have. But I'll say this, that um, perhaps the greatest reason that we don't come uh, to deal with some of the things, the worries, the cares, the, the, the burdens, the fears that uh, that entangle our lives is because we just simply feel that the seriousness of the burden is not at a level where we kind of need to bring it up before people or before God. This is just kind of light. And so if that's the question, if that's the issue, let me ask you an important question. The question is this, what is your number? Like if, if, if 10 out of 10 is, is the, the ultimate burden and if one out of 10 is just kind of an easy burden that we carry, what is the number of seriousness that your burden comes to before you begin to say, 
maybe I should bring this to the Lord, or maybe I need to bring this be- be- before some good, solid friends, or maybe I should come and, and have this prayed over with a, go- a lot of godly people. Is it seven? Is it eight? And if that's the case, if what you do is wait until an eight, a burden becomes an eight before you bring it to the Lord and to, to other people, does that not mean that when you're carrying that eight, you're probably always carrying the one, two, three, four, five, six, and sevens that are there as well? Because come on, we're not always just bearing one burden, are we? And, and I have found that although the scripture, the mandate of scripture is that we need to cast all of our care upon the Lord because he cares for us, And because uh, Galatians 6.1 says that we need to bear one another's burdens, it says that's the law of Christ. That that despite that is the case, there is still a certain amount of burden that we carry that doesn't even get to that point. And I've been a pastor long enough to realize that we carry way too much that you may be here sitting, eating breakfast in your pajamas. You might be with a number of people enjoying a time together, kind of having a house church uh, uh, before we get ourselves together. And we're carrying a whole lot of burdens that I don't think that we need to. And so as a pastor, it's my job um, to declare the word of God in the process of all those burdens, in all of those fears. I think that there are some solid scriptures that we can look to, that we can provide, we can see the provision of healing to take place in our lives. And I have a passage of scripture, one that is very popular, one that has been quoted time and time and time again, one that I've used many times uh, as I counsel and speak and as I encourage people. It's found in Philippians. Philippians has uh, four chapters. Uh, Philippian church had uh, issues with unity. They had problems with persecution. They had problems with poverty. There's lots of things that were happening in the New Testament church, but particularly in Philippi. And Paul addresses a number of these things, and he comes to the end of chapter 4, and he says these words as he begins to wind up to an end. It says this. I'll start at verse 4 of Philippians, uh, chapter 4, and it says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whether it is admirable, if there is any excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Verse 9 says, Whatever you learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So we're going to be talking about a remedy. you got to start with worry and fear and anxiety because worry and fear... And anxiety is alive and well today. And there's something about the paralysis of fear. There's something about the fact that that worry and and anxiety will uh, imprison us. And uh, I came across a quote from uh, Max Lucado, who wrote a book called Fearless in 2009. And he kind of says this. He said, he says, you ever realize that fear will also bring along a form of spiritual Alzheimer's? It dulls the miracle memory. Uh, forget what God, ha- it makes you forget what God has done. It makes you forget how God is. And, and in the process, when you need to be uh, still in the storm, what ha- has you is it has you doubtful and demanding. It comes back to those, those three eyes, isn't it? I get impatient, I get irritable, I get insecure. And this is what happens when we go through times of stress and we go through times of not knowing what's going to happen next. But here's what bothers me about this passage of scripture. I think and I've I've mostly heard this passage through the eyes of verse 6 and 7, where it says, hey, you're supposed to pray and and thank God, and and in the process, the peace of God will come. And this is a really good thing, and I'm going to grab onto that and we leave. But when, when people do that... They don't realize the whole context with which this pastor, pass, uh, passage is. And what ends up happening is you, you, 
basically employ one process in a four process process. Four process process? I don't sound right. A four process, uh, a four process healing that takes place. And so if you give me a few minutes, if I can keep your attention for a little bit longer, I want to talk about the four processes. What does it say before verse six and seven? What does it say after verse six and seven? And how does that help in the healing of worry, fear, and anxiety? Well, the first, the first process is what I'll call the capitulation process. And it is the foundation process. Everything is built on this and everything falls apart if you don't go through this process. That's why it's the first thing that Paul says. And this is what he says simply in verse four. Rejoice in the Lord always. And I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. What Paul in essence does here, and it is a form of Greek literature, what happens is what they will do is if they want to emphasize, if they want to kind of yell it out, if they want to kind of emphasize it, they'll repeat it twice. And so what he says is rejoice in the Lord. And if I didn't, you didn't hear me the first time, I'm going to tell it to you again because this is important. The foundation of, of releasing fear and anxiety in our life is based on rejoicing in the Lord. Isn't that interesting? Um, so I ask myself, why is rejoicing and why is praise and worship so important in the alleviation of fear and the alleviation of worry? Well, this is what it does. When I, when I surrender in worship, what it does, it causes me to surrender to the fact that there is someone in control who is greater. What I do is I submit myself to the control of the God of the universe. After all, I think he knows what he's doing, don't you? Basically, I submit my power, the, the, the power and the jurisdiction over to the one who absolutely knows everything. And if you never come to the realization of uh, surrendering through worship, then the chances are you will never, ever recover from worry. It's as important as that. The truth is you will always surrender to something. And so this is what Paul uh, says. It is a necessary, a primary ingredient to the elimination of anxiety. If you don't surrender your fear, you will surrender to fear. It will never go away. And surrendering uh, to someone uh, is that you are at that point where you allow the presence of the Holy Spirit to, to in essence, cause fear to be, to be shackled by the, the truth that God is in control. Like really, worship in and of itself um, is the acknowledgement that God is in control. Even prayer doesn't work if you don't surrender it. Stop and think about this for a second. God, I want you to deliver me of this thing that I am not really willing to hand over to you. How, how does God work in a prayer like that? The capitulation process. From there, is the second process. It's the one we're most familiar with. It's called the confession process. It is the point where we actually come to God and say, you know what, God, I can't handle this. This is something too difficult um, for me to bear. I need you to somehow take control. And I've always observed at this point that the, that the points uh, of my greatest fears are often at the intersection of my greatest weakness. And there has to become uh, a time where I say, God, I'm just handcuffed by this. I need to come to you. I need to acknowledge the fact that I'm not going to get through this unless you are uh, with me, unless I abide with you somehow in some way. Now, what happens is Paul kind of uses three different terms for prayer. He uses the word prayer and supplication or petition and thanksgiving. And, and the, the prayer aspect is the part, the point of approaching God. The petition or the, the, the supplication is the part of asking God. And the thanksgiving part is the part of actually acknowledging God in the whole process to thank him for the fact that he is control and that he will do something about it. Because the scripture goes on to say this, and the fear of, or the peace of God, which passes all understandings will keep your heart and your mind in him. See that word peace? It's also used twice in this passage of scripture as well. And there's something interesting when he mentions this word peace. There's two things I think you need to know about this word peace and as he talks about peace. 
First of all, he says it is peace that passes understanding. Well, why would he say, why would he include that passage in it? Why would he say, well, not just peace, but a peace that passes understanding? The only reason that I can see, G, see, sorry, see Paul adding this particular notation onto peace was the fact that the situation that were being faced by the Philippian church was so big that a number of them were saying, well, yeah, that's really good, um, but this is huge. And Paul says, well, you don't understand that the peace that is, God is offering here is beyond comprehension because, because the fear is beyond comprehension. You need a peace that is also beyond comprehension. It doesn't, doesn't mention what the fear is. He never, he never does. But have you ever found yourself saying, yeah, well, I know most of the time that works. But right now I'm going through something that's um, a lot more difficult than it seems like this will work too. But that's why Paul adds that. That's why Paul says, hey, this is a fear. This is a peace that goes beyond your, your most difficult processes. The other, the other thing about peace when he talks about this, he uses the word guard. The peace of God will guard. The Greek word is original here. It's kind of, it's not used all the time in the New Testament. It's used a few times. But it is a military term. It is a term which is used to plant a garrison around something. It is like an armed force that, that gathers. Something, something that, that it, you need an army to, 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 um, to deal with it. And so he says, hey, the peace of God will guard like an army does guard your heart, the, the seatbed of your emotions, in your mind, your thoughts, in him. There's a whole process of peace that he talks about, which is so strong here, which kind of leads us to the, to the, uh, the next process, which is called the, the cognizant process. The cognizant process. So whatever, whatever you think is true or noble or right or pure or lovely or admirable, excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. What happens as we read this, we kind of hear that word finally and we think, oh, he's changed the subject. No, he hasn't changed the subject. This is a continuation of the thought about rejoicing in the Lord. And it is about the idea of the fact that we can't be anxious. He's kind of adding on to this. And if you don't understand this, you only work with half a message. It's kind of like those times when um, I go to the grocery store with a list many times given to me by my wife and I will go to Walmart or whatever place is closest or cheapest, i.e. Walmart. And I will, I will get uh, all the items that are on the list. But if one day all of a sudden I only go buy half of the items and I come home expecting a pat on the back and she says, what is this? You only got five items. There's 10 items I wrote down. And I just kind of said to her, well, listen, I kind of got sick and tired of reading and I just kind of, ah, I kind of, I kind of got tired. And so obviously I didn't get the last five items. Well, she said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Sometimes we happen to do the same things with scripture. We kind of think we have found what we need and then we kind of go on from there. But the things that he says are extremely important because what Paul is doing is he is addressing a situation that I think most of us already uh, no, that, that fear is reinforced with bad thinking. Like fear is, is, the, um, is the incubation tank of, of pessimism. The way you think will either throw water or it will throw gasoline on your fear. The way you think about fear and the thinking process that happens with fear and anxiety and worry will turn a molehill into a mountain. It will be that rocking chair that keeps rocking and never ever gets you anywhere. The acronym for fear, for those of you who don't know, F-E-A-R, false events appearing real. And so think he has a part. In order to conquer your fear, you need to conquer you're thinking, because if you go on uh, uh, going in bad processes of thinking, you end up going in directions that you've never ever had to. You end up uh, dealing with circumstances that never ever come. You end up crossing bridges that you have never ever crossed. I've heard it said this way, fearful thinking is a proof that you can run a marathon without even getting out of your chair. Isn't that true? 
Many times it starts with a thought that leads to an emotion that leads to a behavior. That's why for many of us who are in isolation, that fridge door has swung open more than, more than not, hasn't it? Because we have had a thought that it has led to an emotion and it leads to a uh, behavior. That's why that video, what did you feed, is so important. What are you feeding? Uh, the thing that you feed the most will be the thing that ultimately uh, will end out. The cognizant process asked, what are you putting in your mind? What are you reinforcing? And there's one more, and I'll call it the, the copying process. And it is verse 9. And you think that it's a nothing verse, but it says a whole lot. It's the one time where Paul basically says this, Follow me like I am following Jesus. Take a look at what I'm doing and you do the same thing. And, um, and you say, well, what does this have to do with worry? Well, it has a lot to do with worry and has a lot to do with anxiety. It says actually three things. The first thing it says is this. You don't get through the process of worry and anxiety alone. You need other people. Even if it is to observe other people, you are still utilizing other people. Yeah, we're not in this alone. You can't, you can't get through worry just kind of on your own and on your own strength. That's why God says, cast all your burdens on me and carry one another's burdens. That's why the scriptures are there. The other thing is this. Everybody, and hear this, everybody needs a Paul in their life. And everybody needs a Timothy in our life. You don't just kind of go through on your own. You need to continually be building people up and you need to have people who are building you up. There will always be someone that you will be able to learn from and there's always someone who is learning from you. And this is kind of what Paul is saying. We need to be building each other up whatever stage you are in. And the other thing about the copying process is this, that Paul doesn't stop with thinking. He says, those things that you have seen and heard in me do. He says, he says in the New International View, New International Verse, put it into practice. You can't ponder your way out of fear and anxiety. You can't think your way through. There has to be a time where you actually get up and go and exercise and work through it. However that looks for you, I'm not too sure, but I know that it is true. I know that you do, those things are important. You know, the thing is, I don't think it was ever God's idea to be incapacitated by fear. It was never ever God's will for you to be locked down by fear. Someone basically says fear is this. Fear is, is putting yourself in a prison that is not locked. It's up to you. And, and so I think that Satan has worked hard to implement fear. But God basically asked this question. What are you fearful about? You got me on your side. I want you to remember that God, God's created everything you see. He breathed it into existence. You remember when his people were caught up in slavery? He rescued them. What he did was he parted the sea and he made a way for them, and then he delivered their enemies to them, and he unlocks wounds, and he provides water from a rock, and he provides manna from heaven, and he brought down the walls of Jericho. He froze the sun, allowing victory. He's toppled giants with tiny stones. He's brought fire from heaven. He shut the mouths of lions. He preserved life in the belly of a well. He's fed thousands with a few loaves. He gives the weak strength. He heals the sick. He's made the blind see, the deaf ear, the mute speak, the lame walk, and he's overcome evil, and he's made a way through death for you and me by the death and the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, that we will live with him forever. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we afraid of? His resume is flawless. He controls everything and he loves you. So what are we afraid of? Here are some uh, closing thoughts. 
If, if my child was in the middle of the road and there was a transport truck driving at 100 miles an hour down the road, fear would be a good thing for me because fear would be the thing that would cause me to get up and run and do everything I could to save my son or my daughter. It causes us to act in the right times over the right things. And, and the Bible also says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, that, that fear is a good thing. Fear is something that God created for the right purpose. But what happens when we are stuck in fear, uh, being service, being, uh, uh, us being a servant to fear for the wrong reasons? What happens is our life gets locked up, we become far- paralyzed, and it becomes almost too much to bear. And let me ask you, have you ever seen or talked to a person who has said, you know, I'm so happy now that I've got this fear in my life. I'm, I'm so much more in control now that, I've, now that I have this fear in my life. You never ever hear nothing like anything like that. Fear uh, never ever, improper fear never ever brings anything um, like that. Imagine your life without fear. The thing is, I believe that it's impossible. I believe that it's possible. I think that I think that God has meant for us to trust Him with all of our hearts. And uh, question I have for you, as I close, is: What is your number? How high does that number go before you actually will go to God, or you will actually go to people, or you will actually go to the church, or somehow allow the presence of God to move in a healing? moment. You know, my first, one of my favorite verses on fear is, is 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, where it says, perfect love casts out all fear. You ever thought of the magnitude of that situation? God, by the power of the gospel, has provided fear to be released from our life. And I don't know where you stand. You might be a Christian who has dealt with fear your whole life. And, and or maybe you're here and the burden is not so great at this particular time. Or you know what? You may not even know Jesus and you're trying to figure this fear thing out. Well, there's an answer in Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. Uh, he rose from the dead so that, so that he could provide an answer for not only your fears, but for the sin that somehow holds you back. And and the greatest thing that you could ever do is give your life to him. So let me pray for whoever's out there and what is taking place. And I'm just going to pray that broad prayer, but I think it's a prayer that all of us can relate to. Dear Father, I pray that you will eliminate improper fear in our life. For those of us who have worried our whole life, I pray that you will show your grace and your power. Father, somehow, in some way, I pray that you will give us a revelation of who you really are, the God of the universe. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And I pray, Father, that you will begin to release us from fear, even during this time of unsureness, even during this time when we're not too sure what's happening next, we can still have confidence that you are our God, that nothing is greater than you, that you love us deeply. And so, Lord, I just pray, Lord, as I pray this prayer right now, that fear will subside, that worry will go away, that anxiety will be dissolved, and that you will be lifted up. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, keep texting, keep engaging, keep getting involved. And, and as things progress and as we're able to get uh, uh, together more, we have things that are planned so that we can get together in small groups and things like that. Uh, bear with us. We are doing everything we can to minister to you. But if you need ministry, you need to give us a call and contact us somehow in some way. Have a great week, everyone. God bless and take care.